Hello and welcome back. My name is Sean, also known as Chili Chump. I've been growing chilies and making hot sauce for nearly 20 years now. And we're back in the kitchen today. I cannot wait. We're doing a fermentation with the chilies that I just picked from my massive Dorset Naga plant. We have a big bucket full of these things. These are some spicy ones and I cannot wait to get started. Let's get straight into it. First thing that you want to do is give your chili peppers a good wash. Get rid of any debris, dirt, anything like that. You don't want to introduce any pathogens into your chili fermentation. The next thing you want to do is get rid of the stems and you're left with these beautiful chili peppers. To get a decent fermentation, you're going to need some salt and we need to get the right percentage of it. 1.6 kilograms. And if we do 1,600 grams times by 0 0.025, that gives us 40 grams. So 40 grams of salt. This is just Himalayan pink rock salt. You can use sea salt or uh, pickling salt. It's really up to you. I prefer not to use table salt, but if that's all you got, then go for it. But yeah, I prefer not to use that. If I was doing a brine fermentation like this one over here, this is my first harvest from this plant, then I would be weighing the weight of the water and working out 2.5% salt for that water. But today we're going to be doing a mash fermentation and that means you need to weigh the ingredients and work out the salt according to the ingredients. I have got a video about mash versus brine fermentation if you want to see a bit more details about that. I'll link that down below in the comments or in the description. So just a rough blend, that's all you need at this point. So make sure everything is properly cleaned and then sterilized. And then once it's sterilized, just before you use it, you wanna sanitize. I have again got a video on this process, so I'll leave that link down below as well. Star sand is just phosphoric acid. It is very highly diluted. Any excess that's in there, you wanna get rid of it. Well, that's... <clears throat> Careful of the fumes, especially if you using super hot. Keep back some salt. I'm going to show you a little trick at the end of this process that's going to help you out. The Dorset Naga is such a wonderful chili. So tasty. Most of the Nagas are. One of the biggest problems I see when people message me asking me about their fermentation and why it's failed is because they've got too much headspace in their containers. Now, if you have a look at this, this is way too much headspace. Four fifths of this should be mash or should be your fermentation. And then one fifth of it, the headspace. If you can make it even less than that, that's fantastic. The reason this is an issue and why it causes fermentations to fail we're trying to do everything we can to make sure that this fermentation is going to be using lactobacillus as the dominant culture. To do that, that's why we're adding the salt. That's why we are removing the air because we're going to be covering it up. And uh, I'm going to be using airlock. I'll show you how to do that in just a sec. And you're trying to get rid of that oxygen. And by doing that, you have an anaerobic environment, which allows that lactobacillus to become the dominant culture in here. And then you've got a perfectly safe, wonderful fermentation happening. And again, I have another video talking about different problems that you can get with fermentation. And I'll link that as well down below. Now, we are going to try resolve the issue here of too much headspace by doing a little something that I'll show you in just a second. Let's just get that leveled out. I'm going to just bring that down off the sides as well. You don't want little bits and pieces on the sides. That's not ideal. So when you are using a container that is way too big, like we're doing here, take your salt that you've left behind. So it's still going to be a 3% salt when you put it on the top. It's really going to help it keep some of the bad stuff away. Now, something to notice as well, if you look inside the, the bucket, you can see that there's little bits and pieces on the side. You do not want that. That is likely where you're going to get a little bit of pathogen growth. I'm going to wipe this out using a bit of star sand on some tissue. 
You can use distilled white vinegar if you want. Uh, that's just acetic acid compared to phosphoric acid, but all does exactly the same thing. So just gonna wipe that out, keep it nice and clean. I would recommend getting quite a few of these silicon grommets because this allows you to make a fermentation container out of nearly anything. Once you've got that grommet in there, give it one more rinse just to make sure any dirt from your fingers or whatever is washed off. And then one more spray with star sand on the underside, especially where the seal is. And seal up your bucket. Temperature is the next important thing with the fermentation. You want to try and maintain around about 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And that'll give you an ideal environment for the lactobacillus. I think it's time for us to check in on our fermentations. We have two fermentations on the go. One was started about six weeks ago and the other one about three weeks ago. As you can see, this one here looks absolutely perfect. Bright red colors. I did lose a little bit of brine right in the beginning because this was a very active fermentation. So it did push up some of the liquid up through the uh, airlock. This on the top, in case you're wondering, is a slice of cabbage. I use that to bring everything underneath the brine. That's hugely important to keep things under the brine if you're doing a brine fermentation, at least for the first week while things are establishing. Once the lactobacillus takes hold and becomes the dominant culture in here, keeping things under the brine isn't as important. The real test now is this one here. So you can see this is actually sealed. I haven't opened this because that there is sealed. I can't open it without breaking this because this is a brand new bucket, but there we go. Uh, please be healthy, please be healthy. Absolutely perfect. Look at that. Even with this massive air gap that's in here, my little trick with the salt did a brilliant job and the smells are amazing. So not only are you looking for a lovely bright fermentation, good colors like you see in there, but you're also looking out for the smells. If it has got a bit of an eggy smell, like a sulfur smell, that's not too much of a problem. But if it's something that smells off or like rotten meat, then get rid of it. I'm so, so pleased with that. There's no calm yeast on there either. Well, that could have gone smoother. Spilt everywhere. Oh, you just cannot beat the smell of a super hot fermentation. It's oh, so, so good. Now you may notice this here is a mash fermentation, well, a rough mash fermentation, and this here is a brine fermentation. There's a reason for that, and I'll cover that off a little bit later in this video. Let's give this a blend. We're going to do each one separately so we can see what the pH is of each. That is looking beautiful and uh, bright, vibrant red. Absolutely stunning. Smells so good. Even if your fermentations smell fantastic and look great, I would still recommend testing the pH to make sure that the fermentation was actually successful. Now, when we do this, we're gonna be doing it before we add other ingredients. If you're doing it after you've added things like vinegar, it's gonna skew the results and you don't want that. This here is the Epera pH 20, I believe it is. I'll leave a link for it down below. Absolutely love this machine. Very consistent results. And yeah, it does cost a little bit more than some of the cheap ones that you get and that I've had in the past, but it does a great job. The cheap ones, perfectly fine as well. Just maybe calibrating them more often than this. 3.3, uh, 3. 3. Point... <coughs> oh, excuse me. Wow, the fumes are getting to me. Uh, 3.5, 3.6. Anything below 4.6, you're okay, especially for a shorter term fermentation where it's three weeks or under. Anything over that, you should be expecting to be at least 3.5, 3.6. Actually, this is fermented perfectly. So I don't know if you can see that. Hopefully it comes up on the camera, but that is 3.6. I would recommend making notes throughout your sauce making because yeah, you just want to make sure that you're keeping track of everything you're doing from a health and safety perspective, but also from a consistency perspective. If you know exactly what you did before and you make a great, great sauce and you want to replicate it, at least if you have all the notes, you know how to do that. We're going to pour this straight into the pot because we're going to be using this in just a little while to heat pasteurize the sauce. Now, I do 
consultancy with quite a few hot sauce businesses and uh, lately, and I'm pretty sure it's because of some YouTube videos that have recommended this, they've been asking me, hey, what about heat pasteurizing using your blender? The problem is you're running it for about 10 minutes to get to the temperatures you need. And that's fine if all you're doing is making some sauce for yourself or making some small batches. If you're making a lot of hot sauce and you're gonna be doing it quite frequently, I, yeah, I really do not recommend it. The way I see it, this blender costs quite a bit of money and I do not want to be ruining the motor or the internals or the gearing system in here by running it for that length of time unnecessarily. If I wanna heat it up, I'm gonna use a pot like I'm gonna do today. Talking of consultancies, if you are looking to start a hot sauce business or maybe you are running one and you want to expand, get in touch with me through my website, chilichump.com forward slash contact, and uh, we'll see if we can fit you in with the session. This one here is a brine fermentation, and I did that because I actually wanted to use the brine as well. Now, oh, this cabbage, it looks fresh still. I mean, it's kind of like sauerkraut, just very, very spicy sauerkraut. There will be some vinegar in this sauce, but less because I'm able to use this brine. So we're just gonna pour the whole lot in there with the brine. Something I want to show you here. So if you look at the bottom, you can see inside there, there's a bit of a creamy sort of look at the bottom. I get questions like this all the time, and they ask, why is there a layer of white at the bottom? Is that a problem? Because normally calm yeast is up at the top, and that's pretty harmless. But that layer at the bottom, that's just dead bacteria, the dead lactobacillus bacteria. It's nothing to worry about at all, and it's not gonna affect your fermentation. So don't stress about it. That texture looks fantastic, look at that. Wow, <laughs> this is quite a bit lower. Just letting it settle in. That's really come down low, wow. Settling down at 2.5. That has got to be the lowest I've ever seen them. Hopefully it's showing up on the camera. I'm normally very pleased when I see 3.2, but yeah, 2.5, that's crazy. I have just given this a rinse and make sure you do rinse it as soon after you've used it as you can. Just get rid of any debris. These colors are seriously incredible. While I am sweating and feeling the heat from all the fumes that are in here at the moment, let's talk about some of the other ingredients we're gonna be adding to the sauce. And uh, first up is one of my favorites, it is green cardamom. You would have seen me adding this to quite a few other sauces. It is fantastic for super hot sauces. The thing is, when you're making a super hot sauce and you're using some really, really strong chilies, it can be tough to balance that flavor out because they in themselves are very pungent. And getting through that flavor with some other flavors to balance it out, it can be quite tough. So you need to use something that is very pungent in itself, which green cardamom definitely is. So give that one a try. We've got some black peppercorns, that's a nice balance. And then another one that is very pungent, cumin is just a perfect addition here as well. It is very pungent spice, and uh, you'll definitely get those flavors coming through if you add the right amount. So these are the three ingredients. There is one more, which is a bit of a secret ingredient, something that I've been experimenting with since I had my conversation with Troy Primo during my interview with him. And that is, I hope I'm saying this right, asafoetida. Now what makes this stuff really awesome is again, it is a very pungent, but if you are not a fan of onions, uh, maybe you're allergic to onions, then this is a great alternative. I think if you don't like the taste of onions, you're gonna have a problem with this stuff. This, if you smell it, this is the powdered version. You can get it in like a paste or uh, quite a few other forms of this. It is really smelly. But the powdered version, that smells very strong like onions and maybe a little bit of garlic in there as well. Because you may notice I'm not really adding any garlic to this. Normally I would add garlic to this sort of sauce, but with my experimenting with asafoetida, I haven't needed to add the garlic as well. For things like cumin, if you are using very fresh cumin seeds, then you'll need less, but uh, typically about Heap tablespoon for a liter of sauce works quite well, especially with these soup hearts. And when it comes to things like cardamom, yeah, you really don't need too much, but play around with it and see how you get on. When it comes to peppercorns, 
Uh, yeah, it's basically just how much you prefer. When you season something, do you use a lot of peppercorns? Then maybe you want to add some more, but yeah, play around with the recipes and figure out a sauce that's going to taste good for you. This here will be available in my shop, it probably is already right now, and you can get yourself a bottle. Uh, there will be limited amounts because obviously I didn't make a whole lot this time around. There will be some more a little bit later in the year. I just need to pick the rest of the chilies. For heat pasteurizing, we're just trying to kill off the lactobacillus to make sure that this doesn't continue fermenting within the bottles. When you do ferment thoroughly enough, that's really not too much of a concern, but better safe than sorry. To do that, we need to get this up to just where it's simmering and then drop the temperature down just a little bit. So it's just below a simmer. Keep it there for about five minutes. You're looking for about 75 to 85 degrees Celsius for around five minutes. Uh, something else I have added here is a little bit of white wine vinegar. Now, I know a lot of people don't really like too much vinegar in their sauces, understandable, but if you use the right vinegar, a good quality vinegar and a very tasty vinegar, it's going to taste fantastic and it'll complement your sauce beautifully. So I will need to add some xanthan gum. Uh, I have made a video on this, just how much to use. And xanthan gum, it does two things. Number one, it emulsifies, but it also thickens. So be careful not to use too much. You don't want this too thick, but you also don't want this to split. The reason I'm doing it this way is because the blender here will uh, make sure there's no lumps. Uh, this is going to be extremely thick and gloopy, but when we add it in here, it's going to be able to mix in a lot better. If I added the uh, xanthan gum directly into here and I used the blending stick, then we'd have lots of little lumps in here. It wouldn't have mixed very nicely. And be careful, obviously this is quite hot still. Uh, <coughs> oh, <wow. coughs> Before anyone comments this, I'm not coughing over the sauce, I'm coughing away. So yeah, I'm very conscious of that. Uh, we can see here that this has gone like porridge, but that's perfectly fine. It'll mix in nicely with the sauce. This thing's a beast. Definitely has thickened up a bit. But what the xanthan gum really helps with is to stop it from separating too quickly. It will still separate over a long period of time, but yeah, that's so lovely and smooth. Beautiful. Man, my face is seriously on fire right now. There's one last thing to do before I go and bottle up the sauce and get it ready for the shop, and that is to try some I'm not really looking forward to this because I've, I've had enough of the heat for today. Like I said, I am burning right now. But we've got to do it. We've got to see how it's turned out. I'm not putting a lot on here because I really don't need a lot to get the flavors and the heat. Uh, let's give it a go. Dawson Lager really has a very unique flavor. But getting those uh, other flavors, the cardamom, Definitely. Um, probably could have gone with a little bit more cumin, but <clears throat> I think when the sauce settles and it cools down and it sits for a bit, I think the cumin flavor will come out a lot better. The asfatida, lovely uh, subtle flavor of onion in there, but definitely can taste it. Um, yeah, I'm happy with that. It's a good blend, not too vinegary at all. Uh, that's always a worry, but uh, I know that the vinegar I use is is really good quality stuff so it doesn't have that very sharp taste but man the heat is there that's some hot stuff be cautious if you are going to buy a bottle of this from me uh yeah use it sparingly but yeah i'm pleased with that i'm pleased with that it's great for a, a super hot sauce i'm sure you guys are going to love it if you guys are making your own hot sauces at home let me know what's the favorite one that you've made this year if it's one of my recipes great if not doesn't matter but let me know in the comments below which is the one that uh, you most enjoyed making. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this, I hope that you learned something and look forward to seeing you on the next one. I really need to go wash my face now because man, I'm burning. Until the next video, stay spicy.